come back a little after four and went out there and found him. What do you mean you found him? I found him dead. Okay. The truck was on him. Warning, some viewers may find the following video disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. Carl Carlson was a native of Seneca, New York. Carl grew up with five brothers and a sister. As Carl got older, he always dreamed of joining the Air Force. When he finally entered, one of his jobs was transporting nuclear missiles, which Carl loved. Carl would go on to have three children named Aaron, Levi, and Katie with Christina, his first wife. Christina sadly passed away on New Year's Day, 1991. Carl met Christina in North Dakota when he was still in the Air Force in 1986. Carl and Christina were married, and he brought her back to Seneca to meet his parents. After Carl was discharged from the Air Force, they moved from North Dakota to New York to raise their family. Carl and Christina lived with their three children in a tiny house on a rural property in the woods. On New Year's Day, Carl said that the children were down for a nap and that Christina was taking a bath. Carl was out in a work shed when he heard screams. He ran from the shed to the house to see the house in flames. Carl just managed to rescue his children and pull them out of the windows of their bedrooms, but he was driven back by the flames and the heat when he tried to save his wife. One of Carl's daughters, Erin, would later say that when Carl got her out of the house, he put her in the truck. She stated she was watching her dad as he went back to the house and she said he didn't attempt to get back into the house. He didn't try to break down the board covering the window to the bathroom where she was. Aaron said it felt like he was watching Christina burn. Investigators asked Carl why was the bathroom window boarded up. Carl claimed he had boarded this window up because the window was broken. He told the detectives they never got a new window so he used 17 nails to board it up. Investigators didn't believe Carl but didn't have any evidence he started the fire on purpose. Christina also had a $150,000 life insurance policy on her at the time of her death. Carl got the money and used it largely to finance his move back to New York and start over again with the kids. He didn't go to Christina's funeral and he cut all communication with her family. It was like she never existed. Carl would meet Cindy Best in a dancing club back in November 1992, shortly after his first wife passed away, and Cindy would become his second wife in 1993. Cindy and Carl would get married and have a son named Alex. One night he woke Cindy up in a frenzied panic telling her to call 911 because the barn was on fire. In the barn were Carl's three prized Belgian horses, and they weren't able to get out. The barn was engulfed tragically, and none of them survived the inferno. A few years later, it seemed like tragedy would strike again, this time with Carl's son Levi. Levi was 23 when he died. After a troubled childhood, he left behind two young kids. Carl and his son didn't have the best relationship. Levi was 16 when he moved out because he was tired of his dad's abuse. Levi was always seeking Carl's approval, and it seemed like he wanted to turn his life around and start living the right path. Carl started paying Levi to do odd jobs around the house as a starting ground to build their relationship back up. One day Carl called Levi and asked him if he wanted to work on this truck he had for 50 bucks and Levi told his dad yes. Carl told his son that he wouldn't be home while he was working on the truck but he would pay him before he left. Cindy stated that nothing seemed odd that day. She said Carl came and got in the car, and they left for four hours. After they returned home, Cindy said Carl went into the garage to check on Levi. After a few seconds, he screamed to Cindy to call 911 because the truck had fallen on Levi. 911, what's the location of your emergency? Yes, uh, the truck fell on my stepson. Okay, are you with your, your son right now? Yes, he's not alive. Is, is he breathing? No. He is not breathing. Okay. No. Okay, we're gonna start CPR, okay? Okay, Carl, I wanna start CPR. Do you know what CPR is? His chest is crushed. His chest is crushed? No. He, he's probably been under there for hours. Okay. Oh my god. Cindy found out that 17 days before the death of Levi, Carl took Levi up to a bank and took out a life insurance policy. Carl said he took Levi because he had two young children and Levi was working in a glass factory, so just in case something was to happen, the kids would be okay. Carl made himself the sole beneficiary. He also paid the first premium on that life insurance policy. 
Cindy found out the value of the policy was $700,000. Cindy got suspicious about Carl when he spent a lot of the money from the insurance that was meant for Levi's kids. Seemed like Carl's bad luck has always followed up with a check from an insurance company. He received $700,000 when his son died, $200,000 when his first wife was killed in the fire, $115,000 collected on the barn fire that killed his horses, and $10,000 from that new car that blew up for a grand total of more than a million bucks. Carl never put away a dime for his son kids. After that, Cindy knew Carl was guilty. Cindy feared her husband Carl, but she was convinced the terrible tragedies in his life weren't accidents. She started speaking with a detective and told them how she believed he even had a hand in killing his own son. It just seemed like too many things happened to Carl and he was involved in some way. Cindy said she took her young son Alex and left the home she shared with Carl. They had just been so tired of being terrified all the time there that she decided to take Alex and just go and hide out. Cindy came up with a plan to get the truth out of Carl. She told him that she could only get back together with him if she felt he had been telling her the truth. Even if you said yes or no to what I ask you, then I would know that you, you want to move forward. But I can't get back with you without you telling me what you say to me. So I don't have a whole lot of time today, so I wonder if we can finish our story the other day. Can you just tell me how things went that day? So that I just know in my head. I mean, I understand you're sorry about it, right? Okay, girl, and I believe that. Can you just tell me what happened that day? It slipped. That's not what you told me, though, but that's not what you told me, huh? No, I told I asked you if you pushed the truck and you said yes. I didn't push the truck, I said, but I said I took advantage of the situation once it happened. Carl, you told me that you didn't set it up that way, but when you were in there, you saw the opportunity. No, after it had happened, then I kind of saw the opportunity. After hearing the recording of Carl, detectives brought him in for questioning. This is what Carl had to say. The night, we had a funeral to go to. Left at 11.30, quarter 12, somewhere like that. It was on the other side of Seneca Lake. Um, son was there. He helped me. We were working on the truck, changing the transmission lines, brake lines, the whole nine yard. Come back a little after four. And went out there and found him. What do you mean you found him? I found him dead. Okay. The truck was on him. There is a big problem. You're telling us the truth and saying you had a conversation with him? You're lying because he was dead at that no, time. No, I had a conversation with him, I'll tell you that. Okay. Well, he was, he was either dead when you walked in there no. or as you walked out. That's fact. You're feeling the pressure and you are not able to tell the truth right now. If you really truly felt like you, what you did was right, and which I think you did I in a minute. All right, I, I did not kill Levi. There's no way I could have. But he was dead when I went in there. Okay. Tell us about that. You're doing great, buddy. No, you guys somehow, you know, pulled that out of me. And in a way, it's been a relief. Good. It should be relief. But I can never hurt him. Good. You did. It's all right. Come on. You're that close, man. You're close. Come on. Let it out. Let it out. I'll walk with you if you do. What are you going to do for me? I'm going to stand up and say this wasn't premeditated, cold-blooded murder. That it was just something that happened. It happens sometimes, Carl. That's what I'll do for you. I opened the truck door. Okay. When they did it. <laughs> <laughs> and if I hit the box underneath it, it wouldn't have happened. Carl, it was an accident. 
I said, so why'd you try and hide it? <laughs> Detectives asked Carl, did you know that when you enticed him underneath this truck, you were putting his life at risk? He answered yes. They asked, did you cause the truck to fall on him? And Carl told them yes. They asked, did you leave while he was still alive, knowing that would result in his death? Carl answered yes. In 2013, Carl pled guilty to second degree murder in the murder of his son, Levi. There would be no trial since Carl admitted it was his fault. Detectives stated that Carl jacked the truck up on a single unstable jack stand. And when Levi was under the truck, Carl pushed the truck over and it crushed his son. He also said something pretty horrific. Carl said Levi wasn't killed instantly. Levi was still alive when Carl left to go to the funeral with his wife, Cindy. Carl got 15 years to life for this crime, but in 2014, Carl was charged with the murder of Christina. The trial for that went ahead in 2020. He denied setting the fire, though interestingly, another thing came to light. Carl had taken out life insurance policies on his own grandchildren, Levi's children. He was found guilty of first-degree murder, and he got life without parole. Once he completes his sentence in New York, it's off to California for life. Carl Carlson knew his sentence would be 15 to life as he was brought to the Seneca County Courthouse in Waterloo. His family knew it too, and several relatives, including one of his brothers, told us they were let down emotionally. I think the most troubling part for me personally, not speaking for the rest of the family, is he showed no remorse today, and that bothers me. The smirks, the grins, it's, it's like it was a game, and it wasn't a game, it was people's lives.